Hello, and welcome to another week of online programming from the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation. I'm Executive Director Dakota Russell, and this week we're going to be discussing a subject that runs a little bit contrary to the normal narrative of Japanese American incarceration during World War II. And that's the subject of resistance. Uh, there is a tendency to think about the U.S. government just sort of steamrolling over Japanese Americans and silencing any protests that happens during this time period. And also a tendency to think that uh, people mostly just went along with it, that there were no voices speaking up against it. But as we see from Heart Mountain, that is simply not true. There was a resistance to what the government was trying to do uh, coming from within the camps. And it, sometimes it was an organized one. And we're going to look today at one of the most concrete examples of that at Heart Mountain, which is the draft resistance movement here in the form of the Fair Play Committee. So let's get started with that. So what you're seeing right here represents the end of this story. Uh, here are 63 young men from Heart Mountain sitting in a courtroom in Cheyenne, Wyoming in the summer of 1944, awaiting their trial on charges of draft evasion. It was and it remains the largest mass trial in all of Wyoming history. And so the question remains, how did we get here? How did we get to this point where a sizable group of young men are standing up and willing to face criminal charges for their actions? And that's what I want to talk about today. Because you see, there was always some form of a resistance movement at Heart Mountain. Even before it was a draft resistance movement, there were folks, a lot of times the same folks, that were gathering to protest the conditions that they were under and uh, what was happening to them as American citizens. And so I want to talk about how that begins today. And it begins really within weeks of the arrival of Japanese American incarcerees in Wyoming. Uh, most of them arrived in August or September of 1942, uh, coming in from trains off the West Coast there. And when they arrived, uh, the barracks were set up, uh, large portions of the camp were set up, but there was no fence around the camp. In fact, that wouldn't go up until a couple of weeks later. That's when the government first announced, the administration announced, that they were going to be putting a barbed wire enclosure all the way around the residential area. As you can imagine, the incarcerated here were shocked. Um, now, the government had planned this all along. In fact, the governor of Wyoming insisted that there would was going to be some kind of confinement here if he was going to allow this camp to be built in his state. And the federal government gave him all its reassurances that they would definitely have a fence around them and that they could not come and go as they pleased. But to the incarcerees, this was uh, really quite shocking. They weren't sure why they needed to be confined here, especially as they were thousands of miles from home at this point, and really still dozens of miles from any settlement. There was not really uh, anything between Cody, Wyoming, and Powell, Wyoming, where Heart Mountain sat at that time, uh, not even sparse farms out there. And so it was uh, uh, really shocking to, to, to understand that they were going to have a fence built around them that prevented them from coming and going. And so the resistance movement kicked in early on. There were editorials written in the camp's newspaper, the Heart Mountain Sentinel. There were appeals and petitions that were made to the camp's administration, but it all came to nothing. Uh, the administration put its foot down on this issue. And starting in uh, October, they began to build a fence all the way around the camp and started erecting these guard towers that would go along the perimeter of the fence. Uh, now, there was a small victory that happened in all of this, which is that the government had initially wanted to build this enclosure in the guard towers using Japanese American paper. And that absolutely was not going to fly. And that is the one place where the administration backed down. And so it was built by the military police uh, soldier superstation there instead of using the incarcerated to construct 
Now, not long after the fence goes up, there is actually a separate incident uh, that happens in the fall of 1942 that is also going to stir up the resistance movement. And that happens when a couple of kids leave the enclosure, uh, about 30 kids actually, leave the enclosure one day uh, to go up toward the foothills of Hart Mountain. You see there had been a good snow that had happened early on for most of these kids coming from Southern California. They'd never seen snow before, and so they managed to put themselves together to create some makeshift sleds out of things that they could find around the camp. And they were going to go sledding out in the foothills. Now, there was no sort of sledding possible within the residential area itself because the uh, government had actually graded the whole thing down to a uh, level field right there and taken off all the top soil. So there wasn't any actual contour inside of the residential area. And so the foothills were the only places to go sledding, but they were outside of the fence. And so uh, this group of kids heads out there and uh, is sledding for a good portion of the morning uh, before suddenly these jeeps start to pull up and the military police uh, the guards of the camp start pouring out of them. They collect all the kids and take them down to the uh, guards barracks where they keep them down there until their parents come to pick them up. Now, as soon as word of this gets out, people are absolutely livid about it inside of the camp because they say, wait a minute, you're arresting kids for leaving the fenced area to go sledding here? And the military police really could not justify themselves except to say that that was their orders, that anybody who left the fenced area was to be returned back to the fenced area. And so there was a huge groundswell of anger about this because they said, wait a second, we're American citizens. These are children, they're American citizens as well. You can't limit their ability to just go out and explore around the camp. But that in essence was absolutely what the administration was saying to them. And so there was more and more uh, really willpower to uh, start pushing back against some of these policies after this event happens. And in fact, strange as it seems, you can draw a direct line from this sledding incident to the uh, draft resistance movement that's going to be going on later on. In fact, you'll see a lot of the same people involved. One more thing before we get to that, though, that I want to talk about, which is also labor resistance that happened as well. Uh, there had early on been protests about the conditions of the camp, about the way that people had to live in the cramped and primitive barracks there, but most especially about work. Uh, Hart Mountain was a city of nearly 11,000 people, and people had to do jobs within that city in order to keep it running. And so most of the workforce that kept this place running was Japanese American, uh, was uh, incarcerated themselves. The problem was that the pay was terrible and they had very few workers' rights. In fact, by order of Congress, they were limited to receive less per month than an Army private. So an Army private at the time made about $21 a month, and so uh, incarcerated labor capped off at $19 a month. And that was for the professionals. That was for, you know, your doctors, your teachers. Uh, if you were just the guy that unloaded the coal, you were more than likely to make about $10 to $12 a month. So a really meager wage, even for the 1940s there. Uh, and as you can imagine, working conditions were not great either. You know, the coal, uh, uh, the guys who unload the coal are the first to really complain, those ones who work down at the depot there unloading these train cars full of stuff. Because they say, you know, we gotta get out in sub-zero temperatures in the morning and unload this coal. And yet you're telling us that that work is only worth $10 a month, whereas a doctor who gets to sit up in his office all day uh, is making considerably more than us. We should be getting hazard pay for the rough work that we have to perform. Uh, and so they start to complain about it. Uh, meantime, ironically, up at the hospital, there's complaints as well. Um, the orderlies up there uh, do not care for the treatment that they're getting. There is, are issues with uh, 
conflict with the nursing corps up there. And so there are general strikes and walkouts throughout the uh, fall and winter of 1942, early spring of 43 up there, as well as uh, with the men who unload the trains, there starts to be strikes and protests amongst them. And then uh, as we referenced when we were talking about agriculture last week, the tractor drivers also at one point rioted and refused to work and went on strike. And so, there were several labor movements happening within the camp, and again, when you look at who is involved with them, it always comes down to being this same group of people, uh, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. Now, a single key issue started to emerge here amongst all of these uh, protests that sort of uh, roped them together. And that was that the government was going to have to, at some point, clarify the citizenship status of the Japanese Americans within the camps. Now, two thirds of these folks were of the Nisei generation. So they were born here in the United States. They had birthright citizenship. Uh, but uh, when many of them had tried to exercise that right, say by a young men going to try and enlist in the army after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, uh, young Japanese American men, Nisei men who were born here, were told that they were going to be turned down for enlistment in the army because they were enemy aliens. So suddenly their citizenship, which has always been assumed, is called into question. Um, and then the government also has this habit of not using the word citizen when it refers to incarcerated Japanese Americans of the Nisei generation. In fact, uh, they start using this term non-alien. Uh, Norman Mineta always says, you know, I've never stood up and said, I'm proud to be a non-alien. Uh, but that's how the government started to refer to them. So people really started to believe, wait a second, there is a play being made here to strip our citizenship away from us. And they're going to do it silently without really even declaring it. They're just going to uh, do it slowly through a series of steps here. And so they were determined to fight this and to try and prove that this was happening and try and test whether their rights as citizens were still intact. And so through all these protests, that is the common theme that's going to emerge, whether it's a labor dispute, uh, whether it's a dispute about the fence, or whether later on it's going to be a dispute about the draft here. And the thing that is going to make this especially difficult uh, is that the government is actually going to ramp up their efforts to try and determine who are the loyal citizens of the United States. Now, initially, when they removed all Japanese Americans from the West Coast, they said that they had done so because there was no way to prove who was loyal and who was not. But once the government had them in the camps, they had a change of heart about this and decided that they were going to try and devise a way to decide who was loyal and who wasn't. And so they created this questionnaire, uh, the loyalty questionnaire that you're seeing right here, and actually uh, created is a strong word for it, because they pretty much adopted this thing wholesale from a form that Navy intelligence had been using to test Japanese American uh, candidates who were one to list in the Navy since the 1930s, and in fact, you can still see up at the top there, uh, you still have the selective service seal on the top, which you can imagine caused no end of consternation when people started to see the selective service seal on this, uh, thinking they were being uh, compelled into service by completing this questionnaire here. Um, now, the questionnaire was initially supposed to be a voluntary form that people would fill out if they wanted to leave the camp uh, for a work permit. Uh, see, the government uh, in 1943 had decided that once somebody had proved themselves loyal by their answers to this questionnaire, uh, that they would be allowed to be released to work if they could find an employer to sponsor them. Couldn't go back to the West Coast, but they could go into the Midwest, uh, and sometimes in rare instances, if they could get a security clearance, out to the East Coast as well. Uh, 
Now, the problem with this is that the government is totally opaque about how this loyalty questionnaire is graded. And so even though it starts out with basic questions like your name, your birthday, and so forth, eventually it's going on to ask, you know, what kind of magazines you subscribe to, what your hobbies are, what your religion is. And all of this information is used to uh, make a grade for you that determines whether or not you meet the qualifications as a loyal. And so this was uh, an entirely opaque process. Uh, people didn't really understand what was going on when these started to be distributed. But they were at first told, well, you have to fill this out if you want to go and leave and work. Uh, now, the government's real plan here, it uh, needs saying, was actually to control the migration of Japanese Americans as they left the camps. They didn't want everybody returning back to the West Coast once the war was over, and they thought that if they could slowly filter the population out to cities in the Midwest, they could make it so no one city ever had a large population of Japanese Americans. So it was a wholesale attempt to destroy the culture there. Uh, but before we even got to that point, uh, people have got to figure out what's going on with this questionnaire. And there are a lot of uh, questions about it. Um, at first, they're told you have to do, fill it out uh, if you want to leave to work. But eventually, the inquiries are then told, well, you have to fill it out, period. Uh, everybody who would be eligible to leave to work has to fill this out. Now, this is a bald-faced lie by the Heart Mountain administration. The truth is people were so suspicious of this questionnaire and what the motives behind it were that when it was released in the spring of 1943, most people ignored it and didn't fill it out. They said better to stay here in Heart Mountain and see what happens to us than to take a chance of getting leave and uh, uh, inadvertently uh, show the government we're disloyal in some way that we don't understand. And so a great number of people enjoy, uh, ignored it until such time as the administration said, no, no, you have to fill it out. Uh, there was never any legal basis for that position. Uh, there was never, it was never compulsory to fill this out, but that's how the administration at Heart Mountain made it sound anyway. And that only made things worse. Now, there were two questions toward the end of the questionnaire that uh, really caused the most concern right there. The first one is question 27. Are you willing to serve in the United States, in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? Uh, now, you could imagine a lot of people uh, were really upset about this especially combined with the selective service seal on the front of the questionnaire there, they thought to themselves, wait a second, if I answer yes to this, I'm basically uh, allowing myself to be drafted into the army there. And so people weren't sure how to answer this. And question 28 is another tough one. Will you swear and qualified allegiance to the United States of America and faithfully defend the United States from any or all attack by foreign and domestic forces and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor or any other foreign government power or organization? There are a couple of reasons that for different generations, this is a hard one. For the East generation, the immigrant generation, they weren't actually allowed to become American citizens. They could not be naturalized. Many of them wanted to, but uh, the laws on the books said that they could not. Nobody from an Asian country could. And so uh, to them, they said, wait a second, if I do this, I am also giving up my Japanese citizenship there. I become a person without a country. Uh, if I'm to answer this. And so that caused them a great degree of worry. But for the Nisei generation, the worry was kind of different because they thought that there was a trick baked into there. That this was a question uh, sort of along the lines of when did you stop beating your wife? That uh, if they answered uh, yes, that they forswared any allegiance to the emperor, then would that mean that that information would be used against them to say that they once were uh, loyal to the emperor? And so they felt like they uh, were being run around here. And because nobody had told them how this questionnaire was graded or how it worked, that made things even worse there. And so starting in the summer of 43, you start to see a lot of pushback against this loyalty questionnaire. And a lot of this is spearheaded by this guy right here, Frank Inouye, who is uh, 
a concerned person, younger guy, um, you know, had just graduated college at this point. Um, so he is really just in his twenties, but he starts to look at this and starts to really consider how wrong it is. Uh, his belief is, and the belief of the people that, that start to surround him, is that proving loyalty or being required to prove your loyalty really had been normalized within the camps. They were saying, you know, uh, this is the way that you can prove that you're good American citizens. But he said that that ran antithetical, antithetical to everything that American democracy was about. If you had to prove your loyalty to the government, then the values of the United States that it said it was based on uh, did not mean anything. And so anyway, started by writing some editorials that were published in the Heart Mountain Sentinel, uh, by circulating some petitions around, and eventually uh, started to hold meetings of what he called the Congress of American Citizens within the camp. And so several of the people who had been involved in these earlier resistance movements started showing up to these meetings, including some of the folks we're gonna meet here in just a little bit. And they started to discuss this idea of clarifying their citizenship in more detail. And that sort of rose to the top as the single thing that the Congress of American Citizens wanted to accomplish. Uh, now, as you can imagine, the administration had started to catch wind of this and was very suspicious of it at the time. And so they were watching this movement develop very closely inside of the camp. Um, unfortunately, it more or less fizzled. Um, especially uh, when the administration started to show that it was going to crack down on any dissent within the camp. And especially after Frank Inouye himself, ironically, was approved for leave and he left the camp to go and take a job in the Midwest. And so everything uh, set quiet for a little while in the summer of 43. And eventually, the government follows through on its plan to separate the loyals from the disloyals. Using the information they were able to get uh, from these questionnaires, a lot of which people had decided no was the safer answer to do. Some people didn't turn them in at all, uh, making themselves uh, to be considered disloyal there. And so using this information that they gathered, the government uh, decides it's going to take everybody that they've classified as disloyal and remove them from Heart Mountain and send them off to Two Lake Lake, another camp in California that's going to become the segregation camp for all of the disloyals there. And so in summer of 1943, uh, several uh, families are removed from Heart Mountain and several hundred people really, and sent off to Two Lake Lake there. And this is a scene that's painted by Estella Shigo when all of that's happening, when, when people are departing on the trains there. And so supposedly within Heart Mountain now, we just have a quote unquote loyal population. Now around this time, the army is also beginning to change its policy. Uh, now, I mentioned earlier that young Japanese American men who had gone to enlist at the outset of the war were generally denied uh, the ability to enlist because uh, they were considered enemy aliens that, that were ineligible for service. Um, now, running contrary to the position of Frank Inouye and people like him, the Japanese American Citizens League this whole time have been pushing the army to accept Japanese Americans. They said, you have to let us prove our loyalty. And the way that we can prove our loyalty best is by military service. And so they have been lobbying the army pretty much since the beginning of the war to start taking Japanese American volunteers uh, from outside, from within the, the camps there, as well as outside. Uh, and so in early 1943, uh, they are successful. The army changes its policy, um, but it creates a segregated unit for Japanese Americans and won't let them serve in the general army. Uh, they create the 442nd, uh, which is a, a segregated uh, group right there. And then there are also a few folks who serve in specialized positions, like in the military intelligence service as translators there. Uh, 
And so the administration within the camp, the, the leaders at Heart Mountain really start to push a volunteer program in early 1943. They hold uh, big ceremonies, like this is an induction ceremony that you're seeing right here. And so they make it a big event whenever they had a new batch of recruits there to try and inspire more people to enlist. But by this point, the Congress of American Citizens, even though it had sort of gone defunct, uh, was sort of vindicated by this segregation that's going to happen later on when they send all those folks to Tule Lake. People still really start to stand up and take notice of this and say, wait a second, uh, we really are being railroaded here. We are being stripped of our citizenship rights. And so despite any formal organization sort of existing, uh, the people of Heart Mountain stand up and actually when the first call for volunteers goes out, only 38 uh, young men from Heart Mountain volunteer for military service. Now that number trickles upward over the years, but it never gets to the point where the government was expecting it to be. And so the administration saw this as a huge slap in their face. They said, okay, well, we gave you the chance to prove your loyalty. You know, everybody said that they were loyal, but when we offered you a chance to prove it, you didn't want to prove it. And they get this pushback that says, we shouldn't have to prove it, we're Americans. And so uh, things started getting much and much more tense. And in fact, in early 1944, the US government brings in a ringer to help them uh, try and lift uh, volunteers within the camp. And this is Sergeant Ben Kuroki, who you see right here, who was one of the few Japanese Americans uh, to actually uh, be able to enlist and uh, serve in, in the war and had since become a war hero as a tail there in Europe. And so Kuroki came and did a speaking tour at Heart Mountain. And he was met with some resistance during that time. Uh, a lot of it centered around the fact that uh, being from Nebraska and having lived in Nebraska before the war, Kuroki was not part of the Japanese Americans on the West Coast that were removed and sent to camps. In fact, there were so few people scattered around the rest of the country, only about 20,000 Japanese Americans, that the government didn't even bother uh, rounding up the folks who weren't living on the West Coast. And so he was allowed to stay home on his farm. And you can imagine that people who were against uh, military service made a lot of this point when he came out to Heart Mountain. And he remembers there generally being a good response uh, for him when he went up to speak, but he does remember that there was quite a bit of tension to the camp at the time. And then it was clear that the volunteer program was not going the way that the administration had hoped it was going to go. So after months and months of this, a lukewarm response to the volunteer program, after even Ben Kuroki here fails to uh, bring up the volunteer numbers, uh, in January of 1944, the Army announces that it is going to begin drafting young men out of the camps. And so this immediately galvanizes everybody who has been involved in previous resistant effort, resistance efforts and many new people as well that say, hey, we have got to form something to fight back against this draft here. And so this is really where the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee is going to be born, the major draft resistance organization. And the mastermind behind it is going to be this guy, Kiyoshi Okamoto. Uh, Okamoto is a little bit of a cipher. Um, his uh, history is hard to put together. We know that he was born in Hawaii, uh, that he migrated to the mainland when he was young. So he was an Issei and he was an American citizen there. Um, he variously listed himself as a chemist, an engineer, a teacher, and more before uh, the war started. In fact, at one point, he, his main effort was a scheme to popularize papaya on the mainland uh, with the hope that it could uh, become as successful as avocado here. Um, and so he had a lot of different schemes, but throughout it all, one thing that was really important to him was the Constitution. And even though he didn't have a legal background, he was extremely well-read on uh, the Constitution and the rights of citizens. 
Um, having seen everything that had happened to Japanese Americans up until now, and knowing that he was the first generation of the first generation to have those citizenship rights, he wanted to make sure that he was using them to full effect and that he was getting the privileges that he deserved. Um, and so he uh, was really well regarded by a certain number of people who saw him as a charismatic speaker, although apparently he did have a tendency to run a little blue whenever he spoke. Uh, but uh, he was a, uh, a real charismatic guy who could uh, definitely command an audience. Uh, but his opponents uh, uh, generally called him obnoxious, said that he was always going around being loud. They called him the latrine lawyer uh, because he was frequently uh, giving his uh, speeches on citizenships inside of the latrines, uh, usually in the actual uh, boiler room in between the, the bathroom buildings there. Um, but they called him the latrine lawyer. Um, a lot of times he'd take over a mess hall as well to give one of his speeches here in Hartmount. And he had really been involved in protest movements ever since the beginning. Uh, if you look back through, you know, the labor protests uh, and things like that, you will see his name pop up over and over again. He was a regular at the Congress of American Citizens meetings. And so with the folks who organized those, uh, a lot of them gone now, having left the Midwest or being sent to Tule Lake, Okamoto really becomes the central figure in the Fair Play Committee movement. In fact, when it begins, he calls it the Fair Play Committee of One because it's just him. Uh, but soon through his speeches and his talks that he gives around the camp, he is able to raise quite a few more people that are willing to follow behind. Don't have time to get into all the leaders of the Fair Play Committee today, but I do want to single out three of his lieutenants that are going to play major roles right here. Uh, they're looking every ounce of the criminal and holding his uh, child is Paul Nakadate. And uh, Paul is Kiyoshi Okamoto's right-hand man, also a uh, very great speaker, also somebody who is extremely persuasive for the cause there. Uh, now, an interesting thing that we're going to see emerge over and over again is that because he does have a family there, Paul is pretty much ineligible for the draft. His stand is principled. Uh, and that's true for everybody else that you see here as well. Um, that guy in the middle right there is Gantaro Kubota. Uh, Gantaro is the Ise uh, leadership of the Fair Play Committee there. Uh, he of course, is ineligible for the draft because he's not an American citizen. But he is going to play a major role in getting the ISE on board with this. A lot of young men were going to decide how to respond based on the counsel of their parents and their elders within the camp. And so Kubota realized early on that it was important that the Fair Play Committee make outreach to the Issei generation as well. And so he would translate the speeches that uh, Okamoto or Nakadate gave into Japanese and he would circulate those around or he would uh, summarize those points in Japanese for the Issei generation so they could get a sense of what the Fair Play Committee was about and what their principles were. And he also knew which arguments to craft that specifically would appeal to, them, to the Issei generation as well. And so he was an important player in the uh, leadership there. And then over there in the glasses, we have got Frank Emmy. And Frank Emmy is going to take a larger leadership role later on as uh, these other leaders are going to be sent away from Heart Mountain there. Uh, and so we will uh, see him popping up again here shortly, but also a very passionate uh, guy and somebody who uh, was a dangerous man to cross. He, he definitely uh, would not back down uh, when it came to an argument there. The principal objective of the Fair Play Committee leadership during this time is to start building up its ranks. And so in addition to going around and giving more speeches around the camp, in addition to holding them wherever they possibly can outside of the eyes of the administration, the Fair Play Committee also begins to start to hold larger and more visible meetings. Um, many of these, you know, after a meal, they would take over a mess hall and 
they started to fill these missiles. Uh, they were really walking the line of criminal behavior. They had not come out and encouraged dissent or uh, encouraged young men to uh, uh, resist the draft, but uh, they were very much using rhetoric that walked right up to that line there. And so uh, they had to walk that very careful line because by this time, the eyes of the administration were very much on them. Uh, and in fact, they start collecting $2 in dues from anybody who wants to sign up for the Fair Play Committee, which they eventually use to purchase a mimeograph through mail order that they have sent to the camp. And so they are able to start uh, putting out these regular bulletins. Uh, which are basically transcriptions of the speeches that Okamoto was given right there. Uh, and as you can see, they are very passionate, even in written form. There's a lot of underlining and a lot of capital letters going on in there. Um, but they lay out the positions and the values upon which the Fair Play Committee is based and what they are and are not going to stand up for. And so the Fair Play Committee begins attracting a number of folks to its roles, uh, you know, especially of uh, those young men that are potentially facing a draft notice coming up. And so meantime, a war of the words is starting to break out with higher visibility for the Fair Play Committee. Uh, the Heart Mountain Sentinel, the camp newspaper, begins to stand up against them. Uh, the Sentinel editorial staff very much falls into the mindset of, no, you know, you're making the entire Japanese American community look bad here. We need to prove that we are loyal and that military service is the way to do this. And so there are a number of editorials uh, published in the Heart Mountain Sentinel. Um, most of them by Haru Omura, uh, who is the editor, who are going to push back against the Fair Play Committee and really uh, try to paint them as a seditious element within the camp that's going to endanger everyone inside of the camp if they keep up what they're doing. But in the meantime, uh, Okamoto and the others have started to make outreach to another paper in the region that is uh, concentrated on a Japanese American audience and that's read within Heart Mountain there. And that is the Rocky Shimpo, which is based out of Denver there. Uh, the Rocky Shimpo, uh, the owner of it, had actually been incarcerated himself and sent to the camps and because he was living on the West Coast at the time. And so that left the editor, James Omura, who you're seeing right here, uh, to run the Shimpo on his own and to represent uh, Japanese Americans within the Mountain West at this time, whether they were incarcerated or not. And James Omura is very persuaded by the arguments that Okamoto and the Fair Play Committee are making. And so he starts to print uh, some of the things that they send him in the newspaper that he's got there and starts to report on this in a generally sympathetic direction. Because both of these papers are well read within the camp, uh, there starts to be a real split that's caused because of this and people start to sort of polarize toward one side or another of this argument in there. And then finally, it all culminates in, on March 1st, 1944, with a huge rally by the Fair Play Committee, uh, with several hundred people in attendance. In fact, it's estimated, not necessarily that all of them were there, but it's estimated that the Fair Play Committee had up to 400 people on its rolls by this time. Uh, so a huge number of people. Um, many of them show up for this March 1st rally, which is the first time that the Fair Play Committee actually stands up and speaks out against the draft and says to the young men of its membership, if you get your notice to show up for your physical examination, do not report. And this is when the director of the camp, Guy Robertson, decides to become personally involved in this. He actually asked for an FBI, an FBI investigation of the Fair Play Committee and brings an FBI agent into the camp uh, to start asking questions around. Um, but the FBI agent makes a very one-sided investigation. He generally talks to the people that are against the Fair Play Committee, uh, 
that are more than willing to smear the reputations of the leadership of the Fair Play Committee and those involved with them that are willing to paint them as violent radicals there. And he does not talk to the people that are sympathetic to him. And so the investigation comes back very one-sided there. But at the same time, the FBI agent says there is not enough information yet to arrest uh, the leadership of the Fair Play Committee, um, which absolutely infuriates Robinson. And so he decides on another scheme that is going to allow him to get rid of the leadership there. And he calls up a leave clearance hearing for Kiyoshi Okamoto. Now, Okamoto had filled out the leave questionnaire like everybody else. In fact, uh, the general advice was to say, uh, no, that you wouldn't serve in the armed forces, and yes, you were loyal to the United States. That's what the Fair Play Committee recommended to its members there. In fact, that was a condition of membership, is that you couldn't answer no, no there. You had to be no, yes. And so, uh, he has filled out his leave application, but he never intended on taking any leave. He intended on staying here within the camp and advancing the goals of the organization. But Robertson calls him up for a leave hearing anyway and says, well, it's time for you to leave. And so as they go through this leave interview, Robertson says, well, the answers that you have given on this questionnaire and the answers that you've given in our interview right here prove that you are disloyal. And so he arranges for Okamoto to be sent to Late Lake as well. And so having realized that this sort of manipulation of the system is going to work for him, uh, Robertson tries it again with Paul Nakadate and does the exact same thing. Even though Nakadate has never requested leave, he calls him up for a leave interview. During the course of that interview, he says that the answers that Nakadate gives prove you're disloyal, sends him off to Tule Lake. Um, at this point, um, Frank Emmy and a, another member of the leadership of the Fair Play Committee decide it's time to make a stance of their own, uh, with their leadership slowly being pulled away from Heart Mountain and sent off to Tule Lake. They decide it's time to make a demonstration for everyone within the camp. And so they wind up walking out the front gate past the sentry station that you're seeing in the picture right here, uh, although the scene was not as peaceful when they did it. Uh, as soon as they tried to leave the front gate, they were of course surrounded by military police, surrounded by guards, and they were arrested, which is exactly what they wanted to happen, because according to Frank Emmy, this proves that their citizenship has been completely stripped of them. They don't have the liberty to come and go as they please anymore, and that they have uh, been denied their rights as citizens by this system here. And so this uh, sort of very visible demonstration uh, definitely has an effect on the people of Heart Mountain right there. And so Emmy really becomes in effect with the other leaders having gone uh, the central leader of the Fair Play Committee at this point. Now, by this point, young men are actually starting to get draft notices. And even more so, they are starting to not show up for their medical exams when they get those draft notices. Generally, they are supposed to load a bus that's leaving the camp, uh, go off to a nearby city, uh, get examined to make sure that they are physically uh, capable of serving and come back. Instead, when they get those notices to go out for the medical exams, they just don't show up for them. They never take the bus out there. And at first, not much happens. Uh, you know, at first, the there's every indication that the administration is not going to make a stink out of this because it does not want this to blow up into a larger issue. But uh, as you saw before with the leadership, Guy Robertson, the camp director, is becoming very enraged about all of this. And so uh, he starts uh, to call in federal marshals to come and arrest the young men who won't serve. Uh, at this time, Frank Emmy starts to see the writing on the wall. He realizes that they're going to move to arrest him as well pretty quickly. And so he actually puts in for a uh, leave hearing himself and says, hey, I want to go and take a job in the Midwest and move my family out of here, out of the camp. Uh, but at this point, even though initially the leave officer approves him, uh, Robertson calls him back up for the second interview and decides that he can't go. He doesn't say he's disloyal. There's not enough evidence uh, to back that up. But uh, he says that 
he is too much of a risk to let outside of the camp. This point, Robinson's bosses in DC even come back to him and say, wait a second, you know, how is uh, any better to you inside of the camp than outside of it? He can't make trouble. He can't convince more young men not to show up if he is off somewhere in a city in the Midwest. But Robertson is absolutely insistent. This has become personal for him that he is going to keep Emmy in the camp until he can get evidence enough to get him arrested. And so as things mount up, uh, more and more young men are being arrested from the camps over the spring of 1944 here uh, and being held in jails all around Wyoming. In fact, there is not one central jail that can hold them all at this point. And so they are scattered between county jails all across Wyoming awaiting the time to come up uh, when they're all going to go down to Cheyenne for their trial there. Um, and so they are sent to trial in the summer of 1944 there. And they think that at first their constitutional rights might be upheld through this process. They say, we're finally getting a chance to test it legally. We believe in the judicial system. Uh, the first thing, First time that the judge uh, on the bench addresses them though, he uses a racial slur against them. And that pretty much disheartens everybody in the group. And in fact, they are all convicted and they are sentenced to three years in federal prison for taking the stand. Um, and then later on, actually, the Fair Play Committee leadership, um, Okamoto, uh, Kubota, uh, Nakadate, Emmy, uh, and the rest of them, um, actually seven men total there, are going to be uh, taken to trial for sedition. The government's decided that it can make a case against them that they were actively trying to persuade young men not to report for their physicals there. And so they also pull into this trial James Omura. Uh, and Omura, is uh, not involved with the Fair Play Committee at all, except for being sympathetic to them in his newsletter or his newspaper and printing uh, some of their bulletins. Uh, but he's dragged in it as well and uh, tried on sedition. Um, his though, since the case against him is not strong and is obviously just the government targeting anybody that had anything to do with this, um, the uh, government uh, acquits him, uh, he's vindicated, and but the others are convicted. Uh, that conviction will eventually be overturned on a technicality uh, about a year later or so there. Um, but in the meantime, while all of this is going on, another 22 young men are actually not going to report to their physicals from Heart Mountain as well, bringing the total number of uh, young men who were convicted of draft evasion to 85 from Heart Mountain. So these 85 young men are going to be sentenced and sent to federal penitentiaries for three years. Uh, the older ones uh, and the Fair Play Committee let, uh, leadership are sentenced to go off to Fort Leavenworth and then the others are sentenced up to McNeil Island there. And for most of the young men who were tried, uh, the leadership, of course, uh, gets out after their conviction is overturned. But when most of the young men try to get paroled in a year when they're eligible for parole, they find that they cannot. And that's because Guy Robertson has stepped in again. Uh, Robertson has absolutely said that they will not be returning to Hard Mountain if they are ever paroled. And since they can't go back home to the West Coast, the government doesn't know what to do with them. So everybody is universally denied parole that first year. After two years, some of them are able to get parole and get out. Uh, and then uh, all of them are eventually free after the three years are up there. On uh, December 1947, President Truman uh, decides that this has been a wrong move by the government. Um, and he definitely is sympathetic uh, to what was happening to these young men. And he says that it was really that under duress, uh, they were drafted and they decided to make a principled stand to protest that. And so he overturns all their convictions and pardons them all. Of course, by this time, uh, everybody has served their full sentence, and so it doesn't do much good as far as prison time is concerned, but it does make it so that these men are not going through lives as felons now. 
And so they work their way back into post-war society after the release. And although among some civil rights groups and protest groups, even going into the 1960s, the names and the stand that the Fair Play Committee took is going to be remembered in larger American culture. They are going to slip in and into anonymity. And for most of the young men involved with this, that was kind of the way that they wanted it. Because even though it might not have been well remembered out in the larger world, this event and this rift that formed within the Japanese American community was still remembered quite well within the community itself. And so because of the stance that they had taken toward the draft, uh, a lot of these young men found themselves ostracized from their community, found themselves uh, looked down upon. Uh, or seen as cowards there. And it was a very difficult transition for them back into regular day-to-day -day life and back into their communities there. And so they were content to remain anonymous uh, and content to let their story be forgotten there because it was causing them trouble more than anything. Uh, it wasn't until much, much later, uh, you know, going into the 1980s, 1990s, that Frank Emmy starts to realize that this story deserves to be told, that these men who resisted the draft were brave and that they shouldn't have to live lives of shame because of it. And so Emmy begins to start to organize them and pull them back together and to try and find ways to get their story out there and explain what they were trying to do back in the 1940s. And is eventually able to make a little headway. Um, and, but it takes a long time. In fact, it's not until 2002 that the Japanese American Citizens League uh, officially uh, passes a resolution uh, recognizing the draft resistors and, and forgiving them. And even then, it was an extremely contentious decision. And that rift, in a way, still remains there uh, in the Japanese American community. And it's something that has been hard to come to grips with. And that's true here at Heart Mountain as well. When we think about uh, how we tell this story, it's easy to paint the draft resistors as heroes and easy to paint, you know, the uh, members of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team as heroes, uh, the folks who serve there, um, and say, you know, these are an example of good American citizens. But there's a duality to it. When we say that, we have to recognize that being a good citizen can mean different things. And sometimes being a good citizen means answering the call to serve, uh, making a personal sacrifice. Sometimes being a good citizen means making the personal sacrifice that's required to stand up when you believe something is wrong and know that you're going to be punished for it. And so that's what this story really teaches us, is that there is more than one way to be a good American. And even though it's hard sometimes for us who wanna see things as very black and white and right and wrong, there are different paths to taking in full advantage of your citizenship and standing up for what you believe in. And that's exactly what the Fair Play Committee did. Tune in for the rest of this week. Uh, we are going to be talking uh, a little bit more about the Fair Play Committee and resistance in different programs that we've got planned for you here. Uh, so we hope you will watch and thank you for supporting us during this difficult time.